Welcome to The Old Men in the Three with J.J. Reddick and Tommy Alter, brought to you by 342 Productions. This is episode 161, Gilbert Arenas. Uh, Gil, of course, is an entertaining guy, uh, thought-provoking guy, tells stories. Um, this was one of those episodes where I, I chuckled quite a bit. Can't help but be entertaining. Even if he tries to be boring, it's not possible. It's funny because I could tell there were times when he was holding back a little bit. And yet I was still laughing my ass off. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's just, he's just got a natural ability. Uh, look, we get into a ton of stuff with him. Uh, we touch on today's NBA, uh, whether the NBA has a LeBron and Steph problem going forward as we try to market the league around superstars. Um, we talk about his time in Orlando, uh, Gilbert's peak, whether or not he feels like the injuries robbed him of a full career. Um, we talk about John Morant. Look, there's a ton in this episode. All of it is fresh. All of it is relevant. All of it is truthful and and honest. And I, that's what I appreciate so much about Gil. Uh, loved him as a teammate. I really, truly did. Uh, we were part of the the bench mob or bench squad. I can't remember what we were called. It was me and Gil and Ryan Anderson and uh, a couple other dudes. But uh, we had a great time together in those 50-plus uh, games that we played in Orlando back in 2010, 2011. Tommy, we're recording this on Thursday, uh, a night removed from Boston winning game four against the Miami Heat in which they had just a dominant second-chance performance. A lot of the conversation today was around whether or not Boston could become the first team ever to come back from being down 0-3 in a best-of-seven game series. And it's interesting because I think one of the advantages they have, of course, is that Tonight, they'll be playing game five in the TD Garden. They've already won game four in Miami if they get to game six. I think the pressure ratchets, ratchets up a little bit against, you know, for Miami in game six if we get there. And then, of course, a game seven at home, anything can happen in game seven. We're one Grant Williams game away, one seven three game away. You know, here's I mean? the issue. I, I wanted to ask you about their talk last, or you talked uh, after game four about the good Boston individual defense, why that was a big reason why, uh, why they won. But to the point about being home, they're currently four and five at home. I know like they, and even some of the games they've won, they haven't looked that great. So it does, it's very weird because we've talked a ton on this show with guys on that team and another team. It's about there being a legit home court advantage there. They clearly have great fans, but it hasn't seemed to make any difference in this playoffs. It's not just this playoffs. They have the most losses in two post seasons at home. In NBA history, bizarre. It's double digits. It's it really is bizarre because I do think it's a tough place to play. Uh, they just they're they're and truthfully, some of this is they their inability to close games. You go back to game one, or not game one, but you go back to the first round, uh, the Trey Young game winner, uh, game one against Philly, James Harden game winner, two blown second half leads which were double digits against Miami in game one game one and game two um the late game execution it's still such a concern for me with the Boston Celtics uh I will say this for them to win three games in a row well it would have to be four but for them to win the next three games you're going to need elimination game Tatum 10 elimination games in his career in those 10 games uh after Tuesday night he's now averaged 30 a game little under nine rebounds, six and a half assists, and 44% from three. So you're going to need that. And by the way, that all includes the, the whatever he was, the three for 17 start in game six, and then he turned it on in the four, fourth quarter against the Philadelphia 76ers. So it includes that game. Just monster performances when he's, his back's against the wall. You're going to need 40% shooting, thereabouts, right? If you're the Boston Celtics as a team, they're 37 and two this season when they shoot 40% or better. Uh, that, so you look down their roster, game four is a great example of this. Grant Williams hits three or more threes. Marcus Smart hit, hits three or more threes. Derek White, Al Horford, all four of them, three or more threes. They're going to need threes. And then on the other end, it's got to be about containing the basketball with Jimmy Butler and defending the three point line. And of course, in game four, they did an outstanding job of that. Here's my, my question about them doing this. They're seven and one when making 15 plus threes, oh, and six when making less than 15 threes. This is in the playoffs. In, in the last 14 games. Yeah. Um, what are the chances that they make 15 plus threes four games in a row? Well, it's a good question. They averaged 
around 16 made threes for the regular season. And obviously, the playoffs are not the regular season. The Miami Heat defense right now, not a typical regular season defense. Uh, interesting little nugget from our guy, Matthew Williams. Tuesday night, they passed the ball over 300 times. Uh, they were averaging anywhere between 250 and 270 passes per game throughout these playoffs. Al said this when he came on the podcast not too long ago. They are at their best when they have body and ball movement. And I think not going against one-on-one -on -one against a set Miami Heat defense, they're going to have more success. This is Missoula ball. And uh, people are overlooking the fact that a big reason for their offensive success last season was because this is what Joe was preaching to Ime. This was a big thing for Joe. It was like, no, we can't play this way where it's my turn, your turn. We have to move the basketball. We have to pass. We have to create closeouts. And when they do that, they're a damn good team. Yeah. They're a damn good team. The other thing on Tuesday night, in the second half specifically, they had six blocks in the second half. They forced a ton of turnovers. That allowed Tatum to get out and transition. Jalen Brown had another off-shooting night. That allowed him to score and be effective. So like, there's, there's a chance. I feel like we are... At this point, sort of, I, I know I heard it today, this idea that uh, when is the Miami Heat going to turn into a pumpkin? And I just don't buy that. They're a damn good basketball team. They've got a track record. They played well the last six to eight weeks of the regular season. They beat the Milwaukee Bucks. They beat the, the New York Knicks. They got up 3-0 against the Boston Celtics. They're damn good. Yeah. It's going to be extremely tough to win game five, much less wins game five, win games five, six, and seven. They also have got forgetting Jimmy, forgetting Bam. They have guys like Kyle. They have guys like Duncan coming off the bench who've been here before, who've who've had big games and moments like this before. And so this is a team that is battle tested. Uh, my question um, before we get into some of the drafting stuff: You can't say Derek White because that's been your answer all the time. Who's the guy who steps up in game five for either team? <laughs> Who's the unexpected guy? <clears throat> unexpected? Yeah. Well, I, I don't know that there's an answer. We're deep, we're pretty deep into the playoffs, and and I've got we we've, we've got a good feel for this series. Uh, for Miami, it's been Caleb Martin, uh, who has played outstanding for them in this fi in this conference finals. Had a great first half on Tuesday night. Went six for six from the field. Caleb Martin seems like the guy. the 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 one the one X factor to me is Max Struess. If Max Struess has a Max Struess play-in game when he hit eight threes, you know, if he has a big shooting night, ah, oh, Miami's tough, tough to beat. So if, yeah. he, if he can be a guy that hits six, seven, eight threes, yeah, I, I, I'd probably lean heavily towards Miami. For Boston, I won't say Derek White. I'll say Grant Williams. Uh, for whatever reason, and I don't know the exact reason, um, you know, I've, I've read that there was some uh, slippage on defense or whatever it is, but he largely fell out of the rotation this uh, towards the end of the season. He's now had a good series, hit four threes on Tuesday night, has played good defense. Um, he could be a big X factor for them. Updated championship odds as of today uh, on DraftKings. This is Den Denver Nuggets at minus two ten, Miami Heat at plus three sixty. Boston Celtics at plus 450. Obviously, Miami's still favored to win the Eastern Conference, minus 285. Boston at plus 225. I, I want to just point out the Miami Heat numbers. They were as high as plus 35,000 to win the NBA championship on April 11th and 12th. Someone could, someone could make a, <laughs> a chunk of change. I mean, put a I wish I'd put a dollar on that just to, just to have a little floater. How about that? I mean, just incredible. Um, so this this you know largely has been an unexpected run. Uh, the other the other uh, data I want to just point out is the NBA Finals MVP Nikola Jokic just won the other night the Western Conference Finals MVP. He's at minus one ninety to win the NBA Finals MVP, and after him, naturally, just based on team odds. Jimmy Butler comes in at plus 390. Then there's Jason Tatum, Jamal Murray in there at plus 2,500. I actually think that's a really interesting one. Murray? Yeah, I just, you know, I what what happens if they double team Nikola Jokic every single time he touches the basketball? Yeah. What happens if Murray has one of those 
uh, bubble type runs over three or four games where he keeps going for 40 plus. Um, that's an interesting one. Jalen Brown comes in next, and I don't think anybody else after that's I, really got a chance. The other, oh, the only one other other one I would mention is Bam at plus thirty five hundred. And the only reason why I say that is I think if Miami, assuming Miami gets to the finals, if Miami wins the finals, it's going to be because they found some way to slow down Jokic. And if they find some way to slow down Jokic, we should note Jokic is six and zero in his career against Bam. But if he finds some way to do that, it's going to be because of him. It's fair, and I would say this too. I'm a little torn on tonight because I think it'd be nice to have clarity and start prepping for this, you know, potential Miami Denver matchup. But I also love basketball and I I, I, I want to see games. And I, I look, I, I think if Boston's able to pull it off and win game five, there's drama. Yeah. There's pressure. A lot of drama. There's heat. T- on the heat. I'll tell you the one thing, <laughs> the one thing we don't want, which is what we've had in the last two games in this series is the thing being decided by 20 points. Either yeah. way, we, either way we want some of this Denver LA magic yeah. where it comes down to the last three minutes. It doesn't matter who wins. Gambling problem. Call 1-800 gambler in Massachusetts. Call 800-327-5050 or visit gambling helpline ma.org in New York. Call 877-8-HOPE-NY or text hope and Y four six seven three six nine. In Kansas, call 1-800-522-4700 on behalf of Boot Hill Casino and Resort, Kansas. 21 and over in most eligible states, but age varies by jurisdiction. Eligibility restrictions apply. See DraftKings.com slash sportsbook for details and state-specific responsible gambling resources. Uh, all right, let's get to our conversation with the one and only Gilbert Arenas. All right, let's welcome in three-time All-NBA, three-time All-Star, the host of No Chill with Gilbert Arenas on Fubo Sports. Gilbert Arenas, my former teammate in Orlando. Gil, what's up, man? What's up? How you doing? How you doing? I, it is so weird to talk to you because I feel like we have not spoken in so long. And it's just a, it's a real treat to have you on the show. I think Tommy and I uh, both appreciate your candidness in the place that you're at right right now. And I don't, I would say that you've never had a problem being candid and forthright yeah yeah i mean this is this is natural for me um you know um you know i always spoke my mind um so you know getting into the podcast world you know it's like oh this is just you know second second nature i i i I guess i was gonna go i was gonna ask your show is incredibly entertaining shout out to josiah and brandon and the rest of the guys that are there um is there anything in particular you like about the space that you were maybe surprised by now that you've been in, in it for a little bit? Um, the audience, there's a, there's, there's really an audience for ex athletes to, you know, um, you know, speak of their journey, speak on a game. Um, when I first got into it, I didn't really like the first couple of episodes and I tried to have them removed and they put them out anyway. And people, you know, gravitated to it. You know, fans really love, you know, um, you know, me speaking about the game, me speaking about my experience. So, you know, um, just the the love that, you know, fans are actually giving us ex-players. You and I were just speaking about a comment that I had on first take that I regret. And you said to me, you just have to not care. Are there, <laughs> you've said some things that have gotten people riled up. Are there any comments that you've ever made where you're like, yeah, I might have gone a little too far. No, there's there's comments that I've made that I've wished that I uh, said them in a different way, but like my thought process stays the same, right? Um, I know the, the WNB one, the WNBA sticks out. Like I wasn't saying I want them to play in um, like thongs. It was just, that was just a video. I was just saying, you know. Um, you guys look like more of the 2000, early 2000 NBA where we had baggy shorts all the way down to our calves and, you know, all this. And, you know, if you changed up the attire, you know, maybe it will, it will, it will be presented a little bit better for, you know, television and the the youth, you know, I could have said it like that, but you know me, I, I, I like dramatic style. <laughs> all right. <laughs> We're going to change the topic now. <laughs> Gil, I actually want to start with this because, this was a topic that was brought up today on, on first take. And I think it's really interesting to talk about. Um, so there, there's, it looks like Miami is going to beat 
the Boston Celtics, and it's, we're going to have a Miami-Denver finals and not a Lakers-Celtics finals, which, of course, will affect the ratings. We're, we're all realistic in this, pro- in this process. Um, and I, I kind of want to get into why that's a problem, but I want to start with this. Do you think that the NBA right now has a LeBron and Steph problem? And what I mean by that is with the Warriors and their aging core, with the Lakers uh, and LeBron getting older, I don't know how many more championship opportunities either of those guys are going to get. And similar to Magic and Larry in the 80s, uh, Jordan in the 90s, Shaq and Kobe in the early 2000s, Th- these two guys have sort of carried a-, a generation of NBA fans. And I'm I'm curious if you think there's anyone that's able to sort of step in and take the mantle from those two guys. And that's funny. I, I didn't really think about um, LeBron leaving until he like coded it, you know, um, last night. And then just the thought, like, wait a minute, like, this is going to be a problem because who's technically the new face that's going to carry the team? Um, you know, with the NBA ratings has been, it's, it's been in three cities, right? When the NBA is doing well, you know, it's the Lakers are playing well. Um, Boston is playing well. And for the most part, back in the day, Chicago, Chicago has been replaced by golden state. So um, at some point, you know, when Steph and LeBron retires, someone's going to have have to mantle these three cities, even Boston. With Boston, you have the two young stuff. You know, there's going to have to be greatness in those three cities for the NBA to really survive. You can't survive if the talent is in these small cities. So they're going to have to come up with something clever to get, you know, star <laughs> players over to the, the the cities that really demand, you know, TV time. We were, we were just talking about this. So don't you think one of the problems though, like it doesn't feel like a lot of people watch Denver before this run. So they're surprised by what they've done, what them steamrolling the entire West. But is that a, is that a sort of structural problem with the way the sport is covered? Because this is even the MVP conversation as well. Like nobody should, no one should be surprised at what they're doing. No, no, no one is surprised. I mean, if you watch basketball, you know, um, the bubble, the bubble uh, championship by the Lakers, that's who Denver lost to. They lost to the champs. Um, the year after that, they lost to Phoenix, Sun, Phoenix, who went to yeah. the championship. And then last year, did they lose to Golden State? State, who won the championship? So, you know, th- th- this Denver team has only been put out by championship caliber team so the fact that now everyone is healthy no one looked at them as a threat when they were the actual uh threat that um that was sitting in the west or just sitting in the league themselves so but it's denver right who who wants to tune in to denver uh (laughs) basketball or just Denver themselves but but this is the problem so if you watch and i know you do I, I'm just saying you generically. If you watch the Denver Nuggets play, and and Jokic talked about this a little bit in the last couple of days. Mike Malone has talked about this a bunch. To me, they play a beautiful brand of basketball. There's ball movement. There's selflessness. Uh, there's <clears throat> insane two man action from Jokic and Murray. There's shot making. Like it. How could you not be entertained by that? And so I, I guess what I'm getting at is how do we in the media and how does the league transition into a new era? And and look, I, I, look, I'm not saying LeBron and Steph will never win another championship. I'm not saying that at all. But the reality is we're in the late innings of their careers and we're in the late, in, late innings of their dominance. And with KD also being a little bit older, it's like, where where are, the, where are the young who are the young stars that are going to to figure this out and be uh, Stephen A has brought this up and I think it's a valid point and I I'll refer to Tim Duncan a little bit on this too I don't think Jokic does the the promotion of the game because he doesn't promote himself right mm-hmm. and so much of, so much of the league is about star promotion now if Jokic was in L A or Boston. Mm. It's a different different story. So 
Um, there's nothing the league can do because the league is founded on the, the, the certain cities. Their first TV games um, when they merged was Boston and L.A. <laughs> that's it. Right. That's, that's all it was. Bird and magic. That's it. The rest of the league, no one paid attention to. No one even knew they was on drugs, right? It was just Magic and Bird, and that's what we're going to just promote, you know, until we get someone else. And then that's when Jordan came, and then it was those three. Um, right now, you know, no matter what happens next year, <laughs> Steph, Golden State, um, I mean, Golden State, Lakers are going to be the big TV games. I mean, if Denver Denver would win the championship and they might get 15 TV games, you know, and that's good. That's good for Denver Nuggets, right? But no one's going to be watching the Charlotte. Um, right? We're, we're going to watch a little bit of Spurs because of Wimby, and they're going to get some TV games. But for the most part, you're trying to put those TV games in big cities because that's what the consumer wants to see. But to, it's about the consumer. But to JJ's you know, point, oh, it, it 100% is. 100%. Yeah, I was going to say, to JJ's point, though, I, wouldn't the counter to this be Braun and Cleveland at the beginning? I mean, Cleveland's not exactly a big market. It is, there is something about selling, the, the player making an effort to, uh, you know, whether it's doing crossover stuff with like entertainment or ads or whatever it is, but being out there in a way that like, brings in a new audience of people who are not just specifically watching their games. I mean, go like when you were in DC, I wouldn't even say DC is the biggest market, but you, you had a huge sort of like international fan base. It feels like. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's, it's the players, their personality. Um, you know, Jokic is, is, is great, but he doesn't have it. Right. He, he doesn't have the ick factor that, that is great for TV, right? The game itself is, it's no different than what Spurs were doing or Detroit Pistons, how they were just a great team. Nobody wants to watch great teams. They want to watch great dominant players. And for the, for the consumer, Jokic game is not sexy. It's sexy for basketball players that, oh man, what he's doing is unreal. But if you're not like Giannis or John Moran jumping out the gym, putting your elbows on the backboard, Right. Or you're shooting 50 foot three pointers. Other than that, what are the stars doing in those big cities? Yeah. You know, so no matter how you sell them, unless he's in Boston, New York, L.A., no one, no one's going to be paying attention to that game. You know, and, but if he played in those three cities, then what he's doing is wonderful. And, you know, ticket sales and they can promote all what he's doing. I, I would say this to Tommy's point because I think it's a valid point bringing up Braun and Cleveland. I I do feel that this year with the opportunity potentially for Jimmy to win his first championship, Jokic to win his first championship, obviously if the Celtics do something that's never been done in history and come back from down 3-0, Tatum his first championship. Now all of a sudden we have a sixth active player who, with LeBron being limited last night, we are going to have a sixth active player who has been the best player on a championship team. And I do think winning a ring matters in this entire conversation. I, I think marketing players is great. And I, to be honest, I, Zion being out for, for most of his career, I think that hurts because I do think he has that it factor, even though he's in a small city right now. Um, and, and so I, I think winning a championship kind of changes a little bit of the casual fans perspective. And look, the NBA has a bunch of diehard fans, but we do in a way have to cater to the casual fan. We have to, not everybody is uh Nikias Duncan and Steve Jones who can break down the Charlotte Hornets uh, pick and roll defense in March. Cause again, I don't care about that. And I've watched the NBA every night. Listen, we as we get, we're hoopers, so we can see the importance of players. But um, the NBA is not built off of that. They don't survive off that. They never have. Um, Tim Duncan was four rings in, and when he went to go win his fifth one, we said, "Oh shit, this is boring." <laughs> Nobody wants to see Tim Duncan and the Spurs in the championship. That's just facts. No matter how many rings they won, no one really cared about the Spurs like that besides Texas and San Antonio themselves. So um, he can win another championship. I mean, um, you know, Jokic can win his championship. No one's going to care. Let's just be honest. I'm sorry. He's not going to go from where he is right now to this 
super mega star because he's not doing anything kids want to see. Right. Mm. Uh, mm. He, you know, Giannis, come on, he's running, jumping, dunking, and you know, he's he's fun loving, he's he's kid friendly. Same thing with John Morant. Jumping, dunking, kid friendly. You know, he's gonna dance all through the through the night. Um and no matter how bad that we try to, you know, tear him down, if the kids want his product, there's nothing the NBA or any of us can do. Um, it's it's the, the survival is what are kids watching, what is uh, what channels are being hit? You know, everyone loves the Grizzlies because of John Moran. Other than that, nobody wants to watch the Grizzlies. They want to see him do what he does. You know, so with Jokic, he has a great NBA game, but it's not an exciting, just like an all-star, right? Last pick, you know, Rudy Goldberg, last pick. Great players, nobody wants to see it. Okay, no well, one. hold on a second. Hold on a second, Gil. I want Jokic and Gobert are two different. That's two different things. All right, last, that's last, two different things. But the last, but come on, you got Jokic back to back MVP. Where did he get picked in the All Star game? Last. Well, second yes. to last. Second to last. Second to last. The back to back MVP, and that's where he gets picked. So you can tell that it's it's all about it's all about the the glimmer of the game. You know, it's you know. We've been behind the scenes. We really understand what takes winning and what Jokic does, what Jimmy does, is what a winning organization, what winning players look like. But the NBA is not built off of winning. It's built off of stars. Um, I have a question for both of you guys about this. Do you think even just the last three weeks, even last night, changes that dynamic a little bit? I think what he did with the crazy shot over his head last night, even just... he didn't have a, a, as good a series against the Lakers as he did against Phoenix, but just what he's doing right now and getting, uh, getting this team to the finals, sweeping a team like LA and getting them to the finals. Don't you think that opens up eyes just even around the league a little bit? Like if they were doing an all-star draft tomorrow, I don't think he's going last in that draft, no matter whether he, or not he's friends with all the other guys. What do you think? Last. <laughs> you still think so? Come on, you're, you're, we're, we're, we're talking about a back-to-back MVP who gets picked second to last. It, we're back-to-back MVP. So we're talking about a very talented individual. Just when you're talking about showsmanship, you know, there's just, he doesn't have it, you know? And I'm, you know, he's going to be finals and he's going to win a championship finals MVP. It's not going to change the audience no, no, they're, the Nike's not going to come out with some Jokic shoes and everybody's going to run to the store and buy the, the Jokic's, the, you know, the Jokers. No, no one's doing that, right? He is, you have to be a diehard basketball fan to understand what Joker's doing. Other than that, you're there for the long threes, the Duncan, right? Or Lakers. That's. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I I do I do think in terms of the All Star game, some of this is on Jokic himself, who has been pretty upfront that the game's not for him. He's not particularly interested in the the rah rah of the game, and that's fine. Um, it will be interesting to see if he wins, if Jimmy wins. I, I I do think it's a moment. It's an interesting moment for the NBA, and I'm not a marketing expert, but figuring out how to sell the next generation. Whether that is Jokic or not, I think we're at a sort of an inflection point over the next year to two years about how to sell the NBA going forward. And in some ways, Gil, I know that Kobe was still in his prime once he uh, Shaq left LA. But in some ways, there was a little bit of uh, you know a, a few year gap where it felt like we could be headed to that. Right, the post two thousand two. Shaq and Kobe Lakers, Duncan wins in 03, Pistons win in 04, Spurs win in 05, Heat with a young D-Wade win in 06, Spurs win in 07, and then it's Boston, LA, LA, right? That little gap there, though, I, I, I feel like that's kind of where we're headed a little bit in terms of trying to figure out the next Golden State, the next mm-hmm. Steph Curry. And it remains to be seen, but I'm just saying there. This is a moment in time that is, it's it's pretty important for the NBA and the new TV deals coming up in 2025. Uh, so I don't know. I, I'm just I'm kind of fascinated by all of this right now. Yeah, it's 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 one of those things where um, you know you know Boston has a chance with you know Tatum, young guy, right? Um, Brown, very young guy. 
Um, they're holding in a big market. Um, L.A., once LeBron goes, they're going to have to try to fill that void. You know, if that's trying to, you know, get John Moran over there. I don't I don't see uh, Dallas giving up Luka. <laughs> um, they're not that dumb. Um, Denver, I mean, you know, y- y- Jokic is technically in our standards. He's on the back nine of his career. This is year nine. So he is on the down the downside of, you know, w- what he is going to be capable of. Um, Wait, hold on. Jokic? He's on year nine. But he's 28. Year nine. This is the... Per- it's like golf. You play golf. Uh, okay, but hold on a second. Steph won at 27, his first championship. LeBron, first championship at 27. Jordan, first championship at 28. Kobe's first championship without Shaq at 30. Hakeem's first championships were in his third. Like, I don't think he's in the back nine. He's in no, the back but, nine. He's maybe, not, he's maybe in the four, he's bottom of the fourth, top of the fifth. But do you, do you think he plays 18 years? Dominant. So if you, if you don't think that's going to happen, then he's on the back nine. Well, Jordan, Jordan didn't play 18 years. What about his game would not allow him to play 18 years? It's not like he's, you know, running, like you said, like he's not running and jumping and, you know, beating his body. Gil, I guess what Tommy and I are getting at, why are you such a Jokic hater? <laughs> no, 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 no. I love, I don't, no, no. As, a, as a hooper, I love his game. I would love to play with a guy like that. Um, I'm just talking about just the business itself, right? The business. Um, he's not... 21, 22, 23, where they're going to say, all right, this is the face, right? You're going to have, they're going to push Tatum. They're going to push Luca. I mean, John Moran was okay. there. To me, it's like, it's like book Shea. Zion Shea again, Even but, book. but these are guys, these guys are not in, they're not in legacy markets. To your point, I agree with what you're saying. They're these guys outside of Tatum. They're not in legacy markets. And I think that could potentially be a problem if we don't change how we sort of cover and sell the league. That's, I guess, the overarching point I'm trying to make. All right, really excited about this. Today's episode of The Old Man of the Three is brought to you by a product I use to start my day, Comatier. And I know what you're thinking. I'm just saying that, nope. I literally have a mini freezer full of Comatier here at 342 Studios. So you can believe me when I say Comatier makes the most delicious coffee and it's flash frozen and delivered straight to you. Here's how it works. Comatier sources high quality beans from the country's best roasters like Joe Coffee here in New York. The coffee is expertly brewed and flash frozen at peak flavor to lock in all that tasty freshness. Then shipped to you in 100% recyclable capsules that you store in the freezer. Simply add hot water and you've got a game changing cup of coffee. You can easily customize it in minutes for lattes, iced coffees and more. Each cup of Comatier you make at home will go toe-to-toe with your favorite coffee shop and packs way more flavor than machine-brewed coffee with no cleanup. I'm a big coffee guy. I have two to three cups per day, and I'll be honest, I was skeptical about Comatier at first. You get this mini hockey puck of frozen coffee extract. I'd never seen anything like it before. There's no way this was going to compete with my normal cup, but wow, it was one of the best cups of coffee I've ever had in my life. Drank Comatier now for a year and a half. And now for our listeners, we've worked with Comatier to put together a starter pack of my favorite roasts to help elevate your coffee game. Visit comatier.com slash JJ to try them out. You'll also receive $20 off on your first two orders. That's comatier.com slash JJ for $20 off your first two orders when you join the future of coffee with Comatier. Comatier, C-O-M-E-T-E-E-R. There's no shortage of information available at our fingertips these days, but staying informed doesn't have to be a challenge. Smart News is here to streamline the way you consume media. Smart News aggregates local and global stories from trusted publishers so you can stay informed on what matters most to you, from local weather to trending TV shows, all in one app. Trusted by over 50 plus million worldwide readers, Smart News scans stories, analyzes headlines, and partners with respected publishers to deliver information that helps you live smarter. Say goodbye to information overload and hello to saving time and getting straight to the news you care about. Easily personalize your feed by following top publishers, adjusting notifications, and getting alerts in your area all in one app. Download Smart News for free today in the App Store to get the news that matters most. Search for it in the Apple App Store for your iPhone or iPad or Google Play Store for Android users. Smart News has big stories from top publications to keep you in the know on everything from breaking global and national news 
to real-time local alerts and personalized feeds for sports fans. A news app made smarter. Discover the all-in-one platform that delivers all the information you need. Um, Gil, I w- the other point, I- the other topic that I think has come up over the last few weeks, and I wanted to get your insight on, because of your candidness and because of your experience in the NBA, um, a lot of coaches, great coaches, in my opinion, have been uh, let go um, because they didn't reach expectations of winning a championship. And we all know how hard it is just to win one championship. And whether it's Bud, uh, Doc, who's won one, Monty Williams, who's gotten the Suns uh, and helped build a culture there, gotten the Suns to the finals. Uh, he's he's getting let go. Nick Nurse, who won a championship four years ago, he's being let go. Um, in your opinion, what what makes a great NBA coach? What is the separator? Obviously, having a top five player helps, but but what makes a great NBA coach? Um, the backing by the um, the guy who hired you, which you know, like these guys are getting fired because of cowardness on the guy who's bringing in the talent. Right. You want to blame the coach for the the decisions you're making and you're not going to fire yourself. So obviously the easiest target is the coach. Now, when it comes to coaching, the, the, the real question is, what is the expectations? Like, what are the real expectations? Like, you know, um, you know, who was hurt? Did the players develop? Like if I'm hiring a coach and I'm looking at my team, my roster, if I'm if I'm not a winning team, I know this this team is not that good. Your job is to develop these guys and make them better, right? Once they get to that point, then we can start moving forward. But, you know, you're talking about championship coaches being fired one, two years. You got um, coaches of the year that's fired a year later. Like, what? Who, who's going to replace this? Who's replacing what this person's done, the resume of these 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 coaches that you're you're firing. You think someone's going to come in and do it better than they did? Um, I just think that it's 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 cowardness from the general managers trying to you know um, blame the chef for not cooking up the the the, the, the gourmet meal when you picked all the items. And right. I just think it's just a a coward way of just saying that you messed up by firing these coaches because. You're making it seem what there's no such thing as a great coach if we're going by the standards of, I mean, he won a championship, he's fired, uh, coach of the year, he's fired. Like what makes a great coach? That is the real question for some of these GMs. What makes a great coach? What what are we what are we basing this off of now? Because obviously it has nothing to do with winning, because all the winning coaches are being fired. Yeah. So you're saying that basically the GMs are giving the coaches uh grade A Publix Chuck roast and expecting to get a wagyu rod ribeye on the other end and they're and when it's not a wagyu ribeye they're they're blaming the coaches that's what you're saying so i don't want to put words in your mouth <laughs> i won a championship this year right everyone got better general manager what did you do oh nothing okay <laughs> all right everyone got better but us okay all right, we went, Giannis got hurt. Okay, Middleton went out. Like, you know what I mean? So there's factors that factor in. And, you know, if you're a general manager, like, you you know what the you know what happened, but you're not, like, the pressure comes on you. You think you need to do something. What you do is you fire the coach. That's how it always happens, right? When, you know, this is more of a realistic thing. And, you know, when you look at someone like Pop, that is exactly how you're supposed to treat a coach, right? You know, there's down years. I don't expect him to win. Um, you know, now we got this guy and now he can build this team. I don't think the coaching has that same, um, protection. Yeah. Right. So so you're you're going out there, you're winging it. Frank Vogel won a championship year and a half later. He's gone. Like, it just, this just seems, (laughs) this just seems pointless to be a coach because you're not safe. You can win two championships, then lose two years straight and then you're out. Like, oh, is they some, appreciate you. Is some of this the, the, uh, the, we talk about the media climate, but also like the fan climate? Because, like you mentioned, Vogel, Bud's like this, won a championship. Monty didn't win a championship, but got to the finals, you know, first team in the West. It does feel like it's like you have one bad series and all of a sudden it's like off with his head. And that isn't just the people around the team. That's a lot of that is the fans, you know. So, do you feel like that's gotten worse or it's always been like this? We just see it more. Uh, it's, it's, 
I think it's always been like this, but I think now that um, top tier are being chopped off, like we're really like, wait, hold on. You know, um, I, I remember the, who was the first one he won. Was it Casey? He won um, coach of the year and got fired. Uh, George Carl, Lionel Hollins and, and Dwayne Casey all right. got coach of the year. I, at least two of them got fired after getting coach of the year. Casey may have had one year in between, but I'm not sure on that. But I know all three of them got within either that off season or within six months were fired. All three of them. Yeah. And, and it's like, what are you really telling the next coach? What are you really telling the players? What are you really telling the, the organization? This, 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 this coach got rewarded as the best uh. coach and I didn't appreciate it and fired him. Right. So it, it's really one of those things is, is like, as a coach, what are you doing? Right. We know Darvin Ham. We know Darvin Ham probably is going to be out after next year or the year after. That's just guaranteed. Right. Um, <laughs> there's no there's no secret there. You know, Luke Walton goes to Sacramento on a sorry team. Would you expect him to do what he did with the uh, Golden State Warriors when Curry went down? That's your expectations. That's unrealistic. Right. I, so I, I, it, it's just it, it just seems like it's it's was talking. It's, I was Gil, I was talking to because you I, I, you brought up player development. And I think it's a really good point in terms of the expectation of a coach. Are you are the players getting better with you on the watch? And I was talking to a really smart guy who's worked in the NBA, works in media now, and we were talking about the next innovation in the NBA, right? Uh, strategies change defensively. Strategies have changed a ton offensively. It's like, okay, we get the math equation now. We want to shoot threes, layups, get to the foul line. Um, we talk about the next innovation and how you exploit market inefficiencies. And he actually said this. He said that the next innovation is building great shooters, is player development, building great players, but building great shooters. And, and to me, this is part of what makes Miami and Spo so unique is because that's basically what they've done now since LeBron and D Wade left, they've just found guys who are tough and intelligent and love the game and then turn them into really good NBA players. And so on the margin, they've gotten a lot better, which has allowed them now to compete year after year, even if their roster on paper doesn't look like the most talented roster. Yeah. You know, there's, there's a, you know, even when we played, you know, um, Spold, like he was developing, you know, like when we first got into the NBA, there was no development coaches like that. You know, you, you, it, it was you. Like when I went, when I came to Orlando, you know, that was a whole different world. But man, y'all got chefs, y'all got, y'all got nutritionists, y'all got everything over here. Like the, the, I didn't have this before. Um, you know, when you talk about Miami, they were already, they, they was all, already above everyone else in developing their own players. Same with um, Phoenix Suns, right? Um, they were ahead of the curve when it came to developing the players. But at the end of the day, the, these, the, the players you, you are drafting, you are putting on your team, got to be willing to, right? You can, in, a, in an era where players are shooting more threes and layups, it's not translating to better basketball, better shooters, right? You still got the same great shooters, but for, for the rest of them, it's like, why are you shooting, right? <laughs> why are you taking six threes? You're, you're not like, you're not that guy. Mm. Um, like, I'm looking at the Lakers, like, where's our shooters? Like, you know, you're, you're passing to this guy. This guy can't shoot for nothing. Like, what do you guys do all day? Like, I used to shoot to my, my hands cracked and was, was bleeding. Like, what do you do all day? You have LeBron James, Anthony Davis, right? You're supposed to shoot threes. That means you should just sit in the gym, get on a gun or a coach, and shoot thousands of shots. You should come out here. All these are gone. This, th These are gone. The, the tips are gone. You should have Band-Aid. I should be able to see players with Band-Aids. And that's how I know you're shooting. You got Band-Aids on your tip. Oh, man, he's been in the gym a long time. <laughs> I don't, I don't see that. Like, so we can say we're going to turn these guys into shooters all you want, but you alone, unless you're sitting in there four, five, six hours shooting thousands of shots, 
and putting yourself in that situation. Because when these guys go in a summer, if they don't have a great summer workout or a great summer plan, I, that's not translating to nothing. I, I, I will say it's similar to golf. If you have a bad golf swing and you go hit a bunch of golf balls every day, you're not going to get better. Some of it is, I, when I say building better shooters, I don't just mean the reps. Some of it is just breaking down the basic forms. And, and that's where potentially you could build a shooter. Um, you mentioned Orlando. Uh, you and I were teammates for uh, something like 50 games and then the first round of the playoffs. How would you describe your experience in Orlando? And, and also, how would you describe your experience with being my teammate? I'm very curious. Oh, um, okay. So me, I was, you know, I just came off the locker room incident, you know, spent the year um, being dogged. So when I got to Orlando, it was joy. I, you know, um, locker room, the players, you guys were amazing. Not going to lie. Um the facility, everything about the team itself was A1, like, you know, best organization when it came to taking care of players. Um, Stan, you know, Stan was Stan. Um, <laughs> you know, great X's and O's guys, you know, horrible people person. Um, you know, when you're talking about building, you know, players like, you know, Ryan and, the, you know, these players that you need in games and situations and, you know, you're mentally killing them. Um, and bashing them to the point where, you know, the confidence of who they are, you know, wasn't translating, you know, on the court. Um, you, like, with you, I've always said, I mean, it's, you know, it's like, man, it's like fucking Brad Pitt over here, right? You're, you're, you're one of those guys that I've played in the league a long time, and I've never seen someone work as hard as I did, you know, in a gym, on a treadmill. You know, you, you, you really took, you know, the game serious, which, you know, I, I I didn't, you know, I'd be in a, in a gym three times a day, you know, when I was in Washington and, and never see a player, right? Um, or, you know, the night before the game because we're playing a big team. But other than that, you know, never really seen teammates. So, you know, watching you come in the gym, shoot, work out, just the whole organization themselves just working out. It was, it was a great experience. Mentally, I wasn't. I wasn't where I was when I was in my heyday. So, um you know, it, it 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 was it was wonderful and and sad to me at the same time because you know I wasn't playing, um, you know, so I got down. You know, I mean, you know, shit I was doing, <laughs> right? When I knew when I knew players was uh, injured and he was forced to play me, like, oh shit, I'm about to have twenty tonight. You know, a little shit like that. But um, other than that, man, I I really had a great time with you guys. Um. And, you know, you guys were some like even uh, Brandon Bass, you know, in the summer when I went from like 234 to 206 is because I was working out with him, juicing, going to the box. And so, you know, you, you guys were really great teammates. Brad Pitt. Yeah, he was Brad Pitt. <laughs> is Brad, Brad Pitt. Pitt a hard worker? I don't get the Brad Pitt reference. <laughs> You know, like, uh, have you ever seen, like, you know, uh, Brad Pitt take shirt off just all ass? Only JJ ever get <laughs> oh, 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 offend, yeah, yeah, offended yeah, yeah, by no. being compared to Brad Pitt. <laughs> <Chitt. laughs> I see what you're saying. I see what you're doing there. Yeah. That's, that's JJ, right? <laughs> I see what you're doing there. There's one I person. See what you're doing there. Uh, two, quick, two things real quick. So, first of all, uh, my only career dunk was off a, a pull-up jumper that you missed. That's why I got the rebound. So thank you for that. And I remember you looking at me and just giving me the weirdest look. Like, did you just dunk? I love that. Uh, the other one is, uh, I don't remember at what point it was, but <clears throat> I don't know how it was for you in Washington. But in Orlando, we had uh, taped knee pad shoot arounds. And these motherfuckers lasted a good hour, 15, hour and a half on the court. And then another 30 minutes uh, of film afterwards. So, you know, you get there early, you do your things in the training room, weight room, shooting, whatever. Like on a game day, you could be there easy. And then whatever you do afterwards, you could be there easily nine to one on a game day, which seemed even at the time as a young player, it seemed a little excessive. But I remember <laughs> at one point you went to Stan because you were trying to get out of the shoot arounds. And, and he said to you something along the lines of, uh, you know, if you, if, you don't play in the shoot arounds. Uh, you can't. You can't do the games. And you said, Stan, you can either have me for the shoot arounds, or you can have me for the games. But you can't have me for both. Because physically, I couldn't. Be, I couldn't do both. <laughs> you know, at that point, you know, my uh, 
because of my knee. So, you know, we're doing, you know, hour, hour and a half. When we played Miami, it was just felt like two hours that we were out there on the court with knee pads going 100%. So, you know, when you're talking about going 100%, right, it, that's a game, right? So it's like, I'm not, I'm not AAU. I don't have great knees. So, you know, if I, if I go to shoot around, that's game one. I'm, I'm not good for game two. So you can either have me for either one, you know, cause I can't play both. I can't play back to back on the same day. That's not the way my body's working at this moment in time. Right. So that was really where it was coming from because, you know, like, you know, most of these shoot arounds, you know, my knee was swelling up. Right. Because we're, we're not like we, we understood that. Okay. We're going to go 100% and shoot around. Even if we had to do this shit in um, the ballroom, we, we got to cut through the lane. We got to cut through the fake lane hard, right? It was just weird. Um, <laughs> we didn't stretch for this, right? We knew it's cut. We know it. We, we know we're, we have to do it, but we're not stretching for it. We're not preparing for it. So it kind of really hurt me for not mentally or physically being prepared to really go hard in those shoot arounds where to the point where my knee was swelling, um, and, you know, I, I got to try to see how to get it drained or get the swelling out before game time. So that was that was the weird part. So I was like, you know what, Stan, I can't take this anymore. Either you're going to have me for this shoot around or you're going to have me for the game, but you're not going to get me for both. I, did you bring up the ballroom thing? And I just thought like there was this weird quirk where we would say we're going to we're going to walk through, you know, it would be a back to back or something. We would do it in the morning. Because even if, you know, it was a road game, we'd go to the gym and do shoot around and we'd go live <clears throat> five on five. And we, we did have walkthroughs on back to backs. There was a no sandal rule, no flip flop rule. And that's kind of when you knew like, okay, the cuts have to be hard. You know, if we're top locking, we got to be into the body <laughs> in the ballroom. It was in just the ballroom. In the like ballroom. In the ballroom. It was we're in the ballroom that they put the free throw line out. They made the whole thing and we're playing real <laughs> <laughs> like our shoot arounds compare like you know, as a as a uh players, players that's out there listening to this, our walkthroughs in ballrooms were harder than 95% of y'all actual practice after all-star break. <laughs> like, well, um, who was it? Was it Malik Allen who had to wear the big um, shoot arounds? He had to wear that block because the White Howard's elbows, it kept like hurting yeah, his yeah, chest. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, like he had to wear this rubber block in the middle of his chest because of, in, 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 in shoot arounds. Do they have block. any film of this? Is there anything, is, has anything gotten out? Uh, no. I don't know. I don't know. I know there's a lot of pictures of us wearing knee pads. <laughs> no one, no one would wear them in the game, but we had to wear them in practice and shoot around. It was a team rule. So crazy. like you know, the media would come in that you'd get an interview or, you know, video or pictures of you shooting after practice. And we were all wearing knee pads. 70s and 80s players in practice. We <laughs> elbow knee pads taped up and it was like, like what's going on here? Like it, it was, it was interesting. It was, it was different. It, it took, it took about five years off everyone's career. Yeah. <laughs> hey, Gil, was was sixty? Was the sixty at Staples? Was that um, the, the sort of peak for you in DC? Your favorite moment? My favorite moment was more uh, like I. That was a great game because I had sixty, but that wasn't a great performance. I just you know seven twenty seven free throws. I think I made twenty four. So, um, like going into Phoenix, um, being from Arizona, months prior, telling them that, you know, when I play them, I'm going to score 50, right? They're on a 16 game winning streak, right? Um, Coach Dan Tony, before the game, while I'm in layup line, says, you know, you're going to need more than 50 to beat us. And I said, well, then that's what I'm going to do. And the fact that I did, did it 54 and beat them, you know, that that's kind of really that my like proud moment because you know just the build up that that went on that game like the 60 it just happened and no oh, i got 60 tonight um that 54 was a, a real personal one um because of usa basketball and you know i couldn't get to you know coach mike Trushevsky. so you know i had to take it out on dan tony <laughs> <laughs> so this is this is a real thing this, you were you were so jaded by 
I, I don't even remember the, the circumstances around whether you were cut or, or left off or that you decided to leave training. I don't even remember. But I do remember at one point you said something along the lines of, I, if I went back to Cameron right now, I would score 100 or something like that. Yeah. You're a real sicko. You know, you're a, you're a sick fuck, Gil. Okay, so here, here's the true story. One, okay, my team, right? And you know, you know, you know your coach, right? It's it's about the team, the team dynamic, right? So on one side, he has LeBron, D Wade, Joe Johnson, um, Chris Paul, Mello, Dwight, Chris Bosch. And on the other side, Kirk Heinrich, Bruce Bowen, me. Antoine Jameson, uh, Mike Mill, I mean, um, Brad Miller. Um, he has Shane Batty on the other side. So you can see my team, right? We didn't have the star power, right? So what ends up happening is they decide, Brad Miller, um, of course, Antoine Jameson, and Kirk Heinrich, give me the ball the whole time. Let me just destroy them since I was faster. So we're beating there. We're beating the... the <laughs> We're beating that squad. We're beating the blue squad, right? And we're sitting here celebrating. And for some reason, I got all the hate for this. Right? I, I don't know if it was a trash talking. Y'all can't stop me. I'm unstoppable. You know, I should be playing. I should be the man on the scene. Maybe it was some of that. But rightfully, if we're going to 21 and I got 18 of the points, I'm pretty sure that, you know, I have some bragging rights. So I wasn't getting the playing time. So what ends up happening is we're we're practicing against the, uh, I think it's like the, the Army. Right. Um, it's, it's one of those events and it's really hot in the gym. So me pulling my groin didn't seem uh, normal, but I'm jumping out of the gym like real hot. Like I felt like I'm LeBron or D Wade when I'm jumping. The jumping ability was unreal. Um, and then I pulled my groin. I thought, oh, man, what's that? I went to Colangelo and said, hey, you know, I think I tweaked my groin and I don't want to hold up a spot for someone else. Um, you know, someone else trying to make this team. So I'm thinking I'm already guaranteed. So I'm, you know, being polite, you know, I don't want to hurt someone else for trying to make this team. And he said, um, oh yeah, you know, don't worry about it. You're on a bubble. The bubble. And, you know, I had to look back and look at the players like the, the bubble. Ooh. Like, are, are y'all, are y'all going with like, I'm, I'm, there's only three two-time All NBA players on this team, and I'm one of them. Right? It's me, D Wade, and LeBron James, and I'm on the bubble. Oh shit! I'm out. <laughs> that was the quickest China flight that I've ever had in my life. It felt like a 35 minutes to an hour. That's how angry trying to process what he just said. I'm on a bubble. Like I, I think for like four hours, I didn't watch no movie. It just I'm on a bubble. Huh. Does he, Bruce Bowen's on his team? Brad Miller's on, on a bubble. Oh, well, they got some nerve here. <laughs> right? And when I landed, I really went on a Tupac rant. You can ask uh, Dave McManaman. I wrote, I we when we, we did the blog, I said, USA basketball would not win the gold. They're going to lose because they have all of the shooters coming off the bench and they have all the drivers in the starting lineup and it's a clash. And I woke up probably right before he printed it. I said, Can't just erase it. I don't want to be that guy. I don't want to be the guy that wishes down on our, our American team and boom, boom, boom. He takes it out. And then I get a call a couple hours later, they lost. I was like, Whoa. we're never going to say that. <laughs> but if you ask him, he'll tell you, I predicted it. Yo, how would your career have been different if you had a podcast back then? <laughs> Uh, it would have been good because I did. I was on. I was on the NBA blog. So Dave was my ghostwriter. So I was wild, but you know, um, you know, he just took everything out that he didn't think was gonna. <laughs> what was <laughs> the name of that? But was what was it? Was it Agent Zero? What, there was something to it because I used to read that all the time. Yeah, I don't. I don't know what. It, I don't know. I don't. I don't think I can't we had remember a, what it was called. It was a di- it was like it was supposed to be like this diary thing. You know, it was like me, Dunleavy. It started off as like four players and then it just ended up being me. Um, but my own podcast unfiltered. Yeah. Oh my. Yeah. Mm. I would have been fine. I would have been fine a lot. 
It, it would have done big numbers though. Yeah, but I would have been fine. I would have been fine. I would have been fine a lot. Uh, I mean, Gil, you you mentioned uh-huh. you mentioned uh, when you were in Orlando, it was a different time for you. You're you're coming off um, the suspension from bringing the guns into the locker room. You've had a series of uh, knee procedures done. You're sort of not the same player, and you're talking about. A strong, per- you've always had a strong personality, but a strong personality as a player prior to those injuries. And I, I didn't even realize, man, like I'm turning 39 in uh, in a month. You're 41. And mm-hmm. the last time you played in the NBA was 2012. And I, I didn't even realize we were that close in age because you were just, you seemed so much older than me because you got to the league so much earlier than me. And I guess, how have you sort of, reflected on the pre-injury Gilbert Arenas, the the time of, uh, you, you know, having sort of the prime of your career taken away by injuries. And and just, do, do you feel like you got robbed? And, and obviously you, you made a lot of money. I'm not talking about fiscally robbed, but do you feel like you got robbed of some of the the joy of the game that, that you had prior to those injuries? Yeah, when, when it came to the joy, the work ethic, um, you know, what's so funny is I, I, I even tell myself and I tell my son, you know, like if there's one thing that I can go back and do and I'll say, I'll work more, right? <laughs> I, I want to work more now. Now I, you know, after games, I can work out like, you know, LeBron goes to the gym at one. Oh, I can go to the gym at one. I can just sleep there. Like, you know, th- that's what runs through, you know, my mind of, you know, when I think about the past. Now, I I robbed myself. Um, of my career. I didn't understand um, my knee injury, right? Um, I'm thinking about, right, it's a knee, it's, the, the shit fixes itself or we do a little rehab and I can get back to to what I'm doing and, you know, everything's going to be great. So I didn't really understand the process of, you know, taking time off, letting it heal, listening to your body um, and, you know, get healthy then go out there perform, right? You know, you know, if I'm 25%, 50%, I'm going out there playing. And and that was the ignorance of of who I am. So I really robbed myself of of the career that because if I would have took and understood that this is a serious injury, right? Um take your time, you know, go through the process, right? You might not be able to start the season this year. You know what I mean? I'm, I got injured. I'm trying to start the season. So I'm rehabbing to make sure I'm there game one. Unrealistic. And, you know, but I played game one. Eight games later, I'm out the whole season again. So it was it was just me being just arrogant, you know, just an arrogant basketball player who thought he was invincible. Yeah. That was my big takeaway from being your te- teammate. Just a fucking arrogant guy. That's how I, I felt about you. <laughs> and the funny part is, and that was like 25% me, right? That was 25% me. And, and when I look back at the Orlando day, right? And when I look at the team, the most talented team I've ever had, and I think pre-injury me there, we would have fucking blasted through the East. And the reason I say that is my personality would have told Stan to shut the fuck up. Don't talk to our players like this, right? Don't talk. I, I need to pass him the ball and he needs to hit shots. So you're going to have to shut the fuck up. Don't talk to him. Talk to me. And that's what I would have did, right? Don't talk to him like that. Like, you know, and I, I would have took the, I, because mentally I can take the dumb shit he says, right? But, you know, everyone can't, right? Um, so I would have said, talk, you talk to me, I'll related to him, but you're not going to just sit there and yell at him. And then you expect him to go out there and hit three threes. That's not how the game works. And that's not how he works. So we're not going to pull this shit. And, you know, when I was a rookie, I did that with, um, you know, uh, Jason Richardson, right. You know, we have to go through, um, what was it? Rookie Hazen. And you couldn't rookie Haze, uh, <laughs> um, the number f- the, the number five pick, Jason Richardson. No, no, no. He ain't picking your bags up. No, he's the number five pick. He makes more than you. He's not picking your bags up. I'll do it. And 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 I'm gonna do it if I want to do it. I'm not gonna do it because you told me to do it. 
So I was one of those type of guys. So, you know, if I was, if I was mentally there, then, you know, the whole stand thing is like, yo, you coach, you know, and let the players relay the messages to the players because you're doing a horrible job at it. I, uh, Gil, I wanted to ask you what advice, because we've, we've mentioned it twice now, but what advice would you give John Morant? Um, even though it's not going to be taken because he's 23 on top of the world. Um, the, the, the advice is understand your surroundings. Um, put people around you who have the same interest. And that interest is protecting your brand. Even if it's not your interest, make it theirs. Um, so you need people around you that's willing to tell you no, that's willing to, hey, you, 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 you've taken too many shots. Put it down. Right. It's it's one o'clock in the club. We have to leave. You you need people around you that's willing to be your conscience. Right. Because obviously at the age you are just being realistic, 23, went to school two years, all the money in the world, the face of this, the face of that. You, you're more like in your mind, godlike. Right. Um, so with that being said, you need people around you that can think like a real human and that's going to protect you until you're old enough to really start thinking, right? Because, you know, like LeBron, the same guys that are around him now are the same guys that was there then. So they, they understood the role. They understood the vision. They understood the finish line. He needs to find people around him that understands the same thing. So, uh, Gil, we appreciate the time, man. It was great to catch up with you. Um, let's not, let's not wait another 10 years. All right. If you become the general manager, uh, just let me know before who you're going to pick as a coach. Right. And then I can vet them. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Fair enough. All right. All right, bro. I appreciate right, it, man. Thanks, Gil. All right. Thank you for having me. All right. All right.